Thank you. Just let me get set up here real quickly. Okay. I'm going to set my timer because I have a lot of content. So uh, I will make it painless, I promise. Okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, we've got the right slide up here. Okay, so thanks, everybody. Uh, ben, that was awesome. Uh, so my name is John Downey. I'm a business development manager for our storage services portfolio uh, uh, of services at AWS. Um, there's nine of us around the world. Uh, we primarily focus on uh, meeting with customers, understanding your requirements, collecting uh, the data and the requirements of, of what you want, where do you want to go, right? What would you like us to build for you? We take it back into our services teams. We consider these things. We put together go-to-market models. We put together solutions. Uh, we're engaged in sales, right? So we're sort of in the middle of product creation and also getting deals done and just truly understanding where the market is going. Um, each one of us has uh, a core competency or a different focus, if you will. Uh, my focus is specifically on customers that own and operate uh, data centers with internal storage operations, and how would you federate uh, your internal storage operation with our technologies, right? Uh, in the context of uh, block technologies or SANs that you may have, uh, NAS systems of all different types, uh, backup archive disaster recovery, uh, that's, that's an area that I have a lot of background in, uh, and so what we've done is we've built out a portfolio of some pretty interesting uh, and cool technologies, uh, both ours and partner-based, uh, to enable just that. Um, so with that, this is why I was, I've been asked to, uh, to present on, on the con in the context of, of ingest and storage and archive for content. Uh, quick agenda. Uh, so we're going to focus on the AWS components first. Uh, well, then we'll pivot into partner-oriented components, which either connect into us or run on us or both. Uh, we'll have a quick blurb on TCO and ROI, and then uh, uh, we have a promotion that we'll talk about as well. Um, you may remember uh, in Mark's earlier discussion, uh, he showed a, a global footprint of where our regions are <clears throat> in availability zones. Uh, where last time I checked, 25 availability zones, nine regions, uh, and 43 uh, points of presence for our CloudFront pops. Um, the reason I want to dig into this again, not advancing, there we go. The reason I want to dig into this is because um, Availability zones are clusters of very large-scale data centers that are near each other, right? And then availability zones are all connected on high-speed private fiber, and they're roughly 5 to 25 miles apart from one another, depending upon uh, where you are in the world, which region you're utilizing. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale, in 2003, we were a $5.2 billion company. Uh, so all the infrastructure and servers that powered the company back then, we actually add to AWS every day. So just think about that operation. Think about the size of these data centers. We're talking about massive, massive scale. So when you consider a region, you consider that geographic diversity between these regions, there are certain systems such as Amazon S3 and Amazon Glacier that are distributed software frameworks that overlay all those availability zones and all those data centers and operate as one single system. Right? That's part of the reason uh, that we get this 11 nines of durability so that when your client or a gateway or a fast file transfer technology moves data into a region, we take that file and then we handle proprietary parity algorithms, replication within that region to make sure that we give you 11 nines of durability. So that's sort of a baseline understanding of, of how Glacier and how, uh, how S3 will work. So from a ingest perspective, um, we'll focus on three technologies. The first being uh, Direct Connect, which is a, uh, a private connectivity option to AWS. The second is Import Export, uh, which is a little bit more of a mature service. That's actually a physical disk shipment in. Sometimes that's very relevant. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, an iSCSI gateway that's a virtual appliance that sits. OK. OK. No problem. I'll take a drink of water then. <laughs> happened a couple times. Where does it mark? On this slide? Okay.
You guys look great today, by the way. Just wanted to, it's a really good looking crowd. <laughs> No, no, I can see everybody really well. <laughs> okay. Should we wait for both, or shall I uh, plow through? Yeah, right. I don't even see it uh, warming up over there. It's still blinking. Can you guys see this over here? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay. So uh, three different ingest technologies we'll talk about, uh, direct connect, import, export, and, uh, and our gateway, which is a nice, cozy appliance. Uh, before I go into detail, and let's see if this will advance again. There we go. There's one common theme just to keep in mind. Um, especially important if anybody's planning on doing their own development, like, for example, implement, uh, uh, integrating your own media asset manager, for example, into S3 or Glacier. Uh, this is a key point. Uh, when you use a lot of our partner technologies, uh, fast file transfer, to, uh, for example, a spare is a good example, uh, different storage gateways, most of them have already built in this concept of uh, multi-part upload, right? So we have a component of our software developer kit uh, that enables uh, parallel connections, right? Multi-streaming, multi-threading on a per-client basis, right? And that's a key, key, key tenant to understand as it relates to optimizing throughput over HTTP, right? So having those parallel streams, multi-threading, and then there's all these other best practices as well. Uh, one being request rate optimization. So that's essentially naming schemes such that you don't create hotspots on S3, for example. Uh, there's also TCP window scaling and TCP selective acknowledgement. All this is available uh, online uh, so that you guys have access to all of this. Um, so for Direct Connect, there we go. So what this is is a private... Um, higher throughput, lower latency connectivity option into AWS. Right? So all of you know that you can access us over the internet. Um, for those companies that are enterprises and maybe running MPLS or point-to-point -point or whatever carriers you're working with, <clears throat> you can actually physically terminate uh, your network on one or 10 gig ports. Right? So we have uh, 11 different locations around the world where our routers are stood up in telco hotels. I'll show you the list on the next page. Um, and then you can physically terminate into us, giving you a higher throughput, lower latency experience as compared to the internet. All right, so for bandwidth heavy workloads, this is a critical consideration, especially cost-wise, outbound. So as you move data sets out of the cloud, Direct Connect actually fixes you at a single rate as for the outbound bandwidth meter versus if you use our internet gateway, there's actually a tiered pricing model. And in some scenarios, it can be a lot more expensive to go outbound transfer using internet. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next page as well. So one in 10 gig port options. Um, there is uh, a, a basically a more consistent experience than, that you'll get. Um, and then you can start layering over partner technologies over Direct Connect, right? So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Riverbed in here and their steelhead appliances, which are pretty popular for WAN acceleration. Um, <clears throat> we offer steelhead as an AMI or an Amazon machine image uh, in the cloud. So you can have a you know, physical or virtual steelhead appliance on-prem, uh, light up the AMI in the cloud, have that symmetric architecture, and then have this phenomenally WAN accelerated connection over a private pipe. Um, of course, you can use FTP, different UDP technologies. You're actually going to see a tsunami, um, a tsunami, which is an open source U U UDP uh, demo later today. Of course, there's a spare as well, right? So when you can start to combine these technologies, you can enable a much higher bandwidth scenario. <clears throat> I also included costs, by the way, uh, for each one of the AWS products that we're going to talk about. So I don't want, to, want this to look like it's necessarily a sales pitch, but I just wanted it to be very clear so you can kind of do some computation in your head whether or not this is a fit. So uh, for a one gig port, you're looking at 30 cents per hour. For a $2.25, I'm sorry, for a 10 gig port, you're looking at $2.25 per hour. Uh, the data transfer in is zero, as it is across the board for all of our services. And then data transfer out, it varies based on region. So if you're in the Americas, actually North America specifically, um, <clears throat> you're closer to two, two cents to three cents per gig uh, outbound. Uh, once you get to Europe, you're about four and a half cents a gig. Uh, and the Asia-Pac region is the most expensive because bandwidth is the most expensive there. 
Um, you'll see the locations listed below, so five in the states. So um, I'm out of New York City, so we actually have one at 32A of A course site, which is just North Tribeca. Um, you have uh, one Wilshire and 900 North Alameda. Um, you've got uh, Northern Virginia, San Jose, Seattle, so that's North America. Then you've got three in Asia Pac, Sydney, Singapore, Tokyo. Uh, you've got Sao Paulo as well as London and Ireland as well. So 11 now. Um, I think you guys can expect more locations because this is a very, very popular service. <clears throat> okay, import-export. Um, one of our, our older services, physical drive uh, shipment uh, into us, right? So disk drives. Um, could be a you know, single terabyte drive. Uh, we accept SATA, uh, eSATA, USB 2.0, USB 3.0. <clears throat> we can accept up to an 8U device. I believe the max is 50 pounds and no more than 16 terabytes per device. So, yes, we know we need to increase some of these limits. Uh, but uh, that is, uh, that's, those are the limitations as of now. Um, we have explicit directions on the web, on our website, on where you ship this. Uh, that's actually a rendezvous point where we have couriers then take it to our actual facilities because we don't let anybody know where our facilities are. Uh, we then take <clears throat> those devices to physically manned stations that have all these different shelves of ports. And then we'll plug in these devices, and then you have high bandwidth upload into either EBS, which is our in-cloud SAN or, or block volumes, or S3 or Glacier. You can use the exact same strategy to rapidly get data out as well. Um, <clears throat> I'd say the most common use case here uh, is, is really just massive uh, bulk uh, migration ingest. Uh, and then after that, you know, daily deltas and new changes since then, you'll see commonly come in over, over Direct Connect or, or over the internet. Um, Cost-wise, uh, we're looking at, let's see, there we go, $0.80, cents per, uh, 80 per device handled uh, and $2.49 per data loading hour. Uh, and that does not affect, uh, it's a standard pricing for the storage backends. Okay, so that's import-export. So now I'll talk about the AWS Storage Gateway. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this one. Um, we released this product about, I guess, just over a year and a half ago at this point. <clears throat> we made some awesome strides in this product. Um, so what it is, it's an on-premise virtual appliance that's essentially an iSCSI SAN. That's probably the, the easiest way to describe it. Um, uh, it can, you can create up to 150 terabyte cache uh, in your data center, which is actually a very large cache. If you look at different gateways in the market, that's actually getting up there now. Um, we have two different modes that you can operate that cache. Let's think of the entire instance in your data center as a cache, right? It's a cache to the cloud. Um, <clears throat> S3 hangs off the back end. Uh, what we offer from a cache perspective is two different modes, gateway stored volumes, which was the original iteration, which means that anything that you store in that cache essentially gets mirrored in. So I just typically call it mirrored mode. Uh, but everything that's mirrored in is in the form of an EBS snapshot. It's actually in a backup format. It's our, it's our EBS snapshot logic. So that means you can actually recover that uh, in, in EBS in the cloud, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's also this other mode called cache volumes, which means if you want to reduce your footprint in the cloud, you could maybe have a, I'm sorry, on-prem, you could have a 30 or 40 terabyte cache, you could have 500 terabytes in S3, and it looks like that full 500 terabytes is local, but the algorithms that we have keep the hotter, more recently written accessed blocks in the local volume, and the colder blocks get evicted from that cache, and there's pointers that point to where the actual asset sits, which is in S3. Right, so that's kind of a cool, cool. Most gateways you'll see do that in the market. Uh, there was lots of requests uh, from customers for that. We iterated pretty quickly. That's also a good thing to understand about Amazon in general, is that when we come out with a product, it's typically uh, relatively featureless and atomic, and then we get customer feedback, and then we iterate very, very quickly. So if you guys ever watch how many new products we come out with, the new product releases, that's why. It's because we're constantly listening and we're constantly iterating. Um, so this product is, you know, it's really more of a, even though it's an on-premise ISCSI SAN, and the actual use case for this gateway is backup and disaster recovery. Uh, I wanted to put it in the ingest section because we sent out a patch recently that we can now get about five terabytes of upload and download per day per appliance. <clears throat> That's not bad. Uh, we've, we've continued to iterate on this throughput. You can line these up in parallel, so you could split different jobs across them, if you will. Uh, and then you can actually instantiate the exact same set of bits in the cloud as an Amazon machine image we lovingly call AMIs. 
which I had a hard time digesting when I first came here, but I say it now happily. Uh, so we, we have gateway AMIs uh, that you can light up and you can actually fail over that AMI and then use that either as a point of egress in the cloud to anywhere else that you want to process against that data, or it can actually be the point of processing where you know, you're going to mount an iSCSI volume to something else, some other EC2 instance, and do some processing rendering, for example, against that. So there's the concept of that in-cloud AMI, a point of egress. There's the concept of being able to restore those snapshots in the cloud to do failover and, and restore in the cloud, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it's a tremendous, a tremendous savings. Uh, over more traditional, uh, you know, sand-based recovery, disaster recovery methods. Um, I would say the most common use case for our gateway is, uh, is, is, is backup, right? So we routinely see customers position this gateway as the backup volume behind net backup, backup exec. Uh, for example, Lionsgate is using this as their corporate IT backup disk target for backup software, so is TV Tokyo, for example. Uh, we also see customers routinely implement file servers over this, so we're just the iSCSI backend to a Windows or Linux file server, uh, and then all the data that lives in that NTFS file system is always going to be replicated and snapshotted over time with never ending snapshots in the cloud that you can refer back to. So, you know, when you implement a gateway, part of the big value is, is you just don't need backup software, you don't need backup hardware, you don't need tape, you don't need offsite tape. That's, that's huge. Uh, that's a big deal. So, so this is uh, some of the ways that customers are consuming this technology. From a cost perspective, um, it's $125 for the bits uh, per month, uh, and then there's a cost of nine and a half cents a gig fixed in S3, and then the snapshots are also nine and a half cents a gig. So like, imagine there being the initial mirror, and then any snapshots that you take is nine and a half cents a gig flat for, for both of those. Uh, we do offer a 60-day free trial, <clears throat> so you can download it, you can implement it into either Hyper-V or VMware, you use your existing hardware, uh, you, you know, whatever the hypervisor supports from a storage perspective, which is typically iSCSI, NFS, or Fiber Channel, we don't care, we just run at the hypervisor layer above. Um, uh, 60 day free trial. We also offer for the first year a uh, gigabyte of snapshots free per month and 15 uh, gigs of bandwidth out for free as well. So we're, we're trying to make it uh, easy to test and play with and, and lower your costs as, as time goes on as well. Okay, I'm going to move into AWS storage specific platforms, which you're probably a little bit more familiar with. <clears throat> so on the left hand side, uh, EBS, Amazon Elastic Block Store, that's an in-cloud SAN, right? It's our, it's our high I.O. Uh, block storage system that we've made a, a lot of really great strides with as well. You can create volume sizes up to a terabyte uh, a maximum. By the way, that storage gateway AMI that I mentioned can uh, create up to 32 terabyte volumes. So if you do have an application that requires a larger volume size than one terabyte, you can light up our, our, our storage gateway AMI and actually achieve that over an iSCSI connection. <clears throat> then there's Amazon S3, simple storage service. This is a distributed object store, uh, a, a very performant object store, web scale, 11 nines of durability. Uh, and then Gl Glacier, which we released about a year ago, has been a tremendous success as well. So this is really a, a tape replacement solution. This is a cold storage archive use case, not meant to put data in and constantly get data out. That's not what the use case is. Uh, we have pricing models that will drive that behavior. You do not want to put data into Glacier and constantly access it. It will cost you a lot of money. And we are happy to talk to you about that offline. Um, but if you have a lot of assets that you want to put in there and keep them there and not touch them very often, it's, it's really the best solution for you. If you have active data, S3 is really the way to go. So let's dig into EBS a little bit. <clears throat> so in cloud, high I.O., um, you know, block storage, specifically for EC2 instances. So think about a traditional SAN implementation. Um, I, I've worked with SANs quite a bit in, in my past, uh, uh, and, and they're, they're expensive and they're complex. Um, you've got a lot of moving parts figuratively and, and literally in the context of the actual SAN system itself, the controllers, the trays of disk may consume multiple racks, fiber channel fabrics, host bus adapters that go in the servers, making sure that all the firmware and everything's interoperable and it's all clean, and then you have to manage that data in the form of snapshots, backup, and then you're going to replicate that data for disaster recovery to secondary locations, and you're going to have times two the complexity, times two the cost. It's what we've all accepted. <clears throat> and these high margin vendors certainly make a lot of money off of this strategy. Um, or you can run your applications on EC2 and you can leverage 
an on-demand, high I.O. in-cloud block storage system with embedded free backup software. You would pay for the landing space on S3, but we do snapshots, no cost for that to S3, so you get 11 nines of durability, geographically distributed, which is very tough to get with tape and other backup mechanisms. You also get built into the cost replication within the availability zone, and you also have an option to replicate snapshots to other regions, which is the newest add to EBS, I believe. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the target for these other storage uh, the landing space is an extra cost, except for the replication within uh, the availability zone. So this is this is significant value, right? If EBS can handle the I/O and the requirements for your particular application, uh, it's in many cases it really is a no-brainer. And and uh, and it, we continue to add cool things. So for example, uh, we released. Um, a component of EBS called provisioned IOPS, we call PIOPS internally. Um, what that means is that you can now dial up on a per volume basis uh, the amount of I/O that you want to provision. Right. So if you, uh, you know, if you buy a traditional on-premise SAN, you got to lay out capital and get all the SSDs and disk types and to assume what your peaks are going to be, and then you may use it a very small percentage of time, and therefore it maybe isn't the best investment. Where for us, you can dial up on a per volume basis how much performance you you want to hit. So we can now go up to a maximum. It used to be a hundred, okay, for standard volumes, which it still is for standard volumes. Now we can go up to four thousand IOPS per volume, and then you can stripe those volumes to increase your overall aggregate throughput in I/O. Right. So we're making significant strides here. Um, so that's pretty cool. And you know, for some media examples, uh, you know, scale out file systems are becoming more the norm. Uh, we are we have about seven scale out file systems that run on us today. I'd say the most common implementations are Luster and Gluster, uh, and both of them will use um, you know, PyOps and, and EBS on the back end. Another thing that's new with EBS, which is cool, we call EBS optimized instances. So these are certain EC2 types, <clears throat> instance types, that now get a dedicated one gigabit connection to the volume, right? So no noise on the line, right? So what that gives you is a completely predictable and consistent performance model uh, versus the way that it used to be, which was you know a shared line. Um, there are different instance sizes. So based on the different uh, instance size, you may be throttled to 500 megabytes or a gig. And then we have what we call our cluster compute nodes, which are the beefy boxes that have 10 gig NICs and 10 gig, 10 gig links, which is uh, a lot more throughput and I/O that you can drive over that pipe. Um, so you know a lot of of very good forward motion with this. Um, Media Silo, one of our partners here, um, and this is a, just a great example of a, of a customer or a partner in this case that has um, the transactional components of their application that leverages EBS, right? It's very common. Um, so, from a cost perspective, <clears throat> you're looking at 10 cents per gig of month provision storage. This is for standard, this is for the 100 IOPS per volume max. And 10, uh, 10 cents per 1 million I/O requests. For Pi apps, you're talking about 12 and a half cents per gig per month of provision storage, uh, plus 10 cents per provision IOPS per month. And then the snapshots to S3 is fixed at nine and a half cents per gig per month. That snapshot logic is the exact same snapshot logic that we use in our storage gateway, and so that's all fixed at the same price at nine and a half cents a gig for consistency purposes. Okay. Pivot to S3, <clears throat> a totally different type of platform. So now you're talking about object storage, which is dramatically different from block storage. Uh, typically, it's you know it doesn't give you high I/O capabilities like block storage does. This is geographically distributed. You're getting 11 nines of durability. Uh, it's routinely used not only for um, production assets, production workloads. Depending upon use case, obviously, it's also routinely a target for backup and for archive. Right? It's just an extremely reliable platform. Uh, you have two different flavors of S3. So there's standard storage that's 11 nines of durability. What that means is that for every 10,000 objects that you store, you can expect to lose one every 10 million years. That's the stat. That's the 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 design goal. So we build two 11 nines of durability. Uh, there's another version of S3. It's called RRS, or Reduced Redundancy Storage. That's four nines of durability. Just think of it as less parity overhead. What that means is we can sustain two outages at the same time within a given region, and you still have access to your data. Um, 
an example of where a, a customer may use S3 versus RRS, a very common one in the media space, is you'll, you'll send in your mezzanine files, you'll sit them down on S3, uh, you'll then have a workflow that, that plucks that file out, transcodes it, multiple transcodes, put those in RRS, use, use those lower cost volumes as origin for CDN, for example, or the next process in your workflow, and if something happens, you corrupt the file, no big deal, let's go back to the mezzanine, transcode it, and re-put it there, right? So you're talking about a 30 to 33% delta in cost. Uh, and it's, it's a good story. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. We've had customers that have implemented this and they've saved tremendous amounts of money. Um, in fact, uh, we'll actually go seek out customers to make sure that they are doing this just so they don't uh, you know, look around and get off the platform. So we're actually really proactive trying to help you guys reduce your cost. Um, from a security and authentication perspective, we have a couple different tools. Um, we have one platform called Identity Access uh, Manage. Uh, Identity Access uh, Manager. So what that enables is uh, the ability to uh, grant permissions and restrictions at bucket levels all the way down to object levels. We support access control lists, uh, bucket policies, query string authentication. Uh, We support, obviously, uh, encrypted connections, uh, HTTPS, as well as uh, we offer encryption for free on Amazon S3. Uh, we call SSE your server side encryption. We also generate the keys, we manage the keys, and we deal with the cryptography on those keys as well. Um, tons of customers using this platform. Uh, Netflix, huge user. PBS, a huge user. Samsung's a huge user. Their smart hub is uh, completely hosted on AWS, and they have a video recording component of Sam, Sam, uh, of, of Smart Hub, uh, where they'll they'll record the video, they'll transcode it, and they'll store it. So that's another use case. I'm working with. Uh, I'm a big fan of a particular gentleman. I can't m- mention his name, but he is a reporter. He's a broadcaster. He has his own show. He's on fire right now. Uh, and I'm working with T3 Media, who's another partner of ours, to take all of his tapes that he has stored in New Jersey and redigitize them, put them on our platform, and then put together a whole monetization strategy for his assets, which is really, really interesting. So lots of great use cases for this platform. Um, Continues to grow rapidly. Uh, Q1 of this year, we hit over the two trillion object mark, which I'm fairly certain makes us the largest single storage system ever in the history of mankind. Uh, We routinely sustain uh, over 1.1 million uh, peak requests per second. Uh, So tremendous growth there. And here's the pricing structure, and I apologize if it's if it's hard to see in the back. Um, so you have your standard storage and your reduced redundancy storage. Um, also understand that you know, as, you, as you scale, obviously costs get lower, and I'll even say this in front of a large group, that if you have very large data sets, uh, usually uh, starting in the petabyte range, we will talk to you about doing special pricing. Uh, and that, that is something that we will do for you if you, if you have at least a petabyte you're looking to move in. Um, that's, and that's pretty common. We also... <clears throat> Have had, uh, as you guys are probably aware, that we've had a lot of price reductions here. I think 37 total, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, on S3, there's been 10. So this is the first product that we released in 2006. We've had 10 price reductions. Five of them have been on the actual cost of storage. Four of them have been reductions on outbound bandwidth, because the bandwidth is metered outbound. And then uh, in June 2011, we made all inbound bandwidth free. Um, so that's also something that you can expect with, with AWS in general. Uh, as it relates to um, to price reductions, <clears throat> How am I doing on time here? Okay. Okay. So uh, archive Glacier. So what you have for this technology now is a penny per gig, eleven nines of durability, geographically distributed. Uh, uh, cold storage archive technology. Right. The penny per gig was the magic number. That was the one we had to hit. Um, uh, you know, there's a, I've got a great story about this, this particular platform. Um, one of my customers in New York City, he's a content aggregator, so he deals with the studios. They beam stuff up over satellite, lands on his desk, he retranscodes, and then sends it out to different cable providers for video on demand. Um, they have a lot of data that they hold on to, and they've been trying to figure out a way to siphon data off both not only their tape assets, but siphon data off a very large Isilon implementation that they have internally. Um, they took our, <clears throat> they took our, our Python Bado SDK, because their application was written in Python, they integrated the Glacier um, uh, API essentially into the application. Uh, they leveraged that multi-part upload, you know, the, what I was talking about earlier, the TCP parallelization. Uh, and in three months, there, there are over 300 terabytes on Glacier and counting. They have actually a pretty cool workflow where they'll take their off-site tape, 
bring it on-prem, spin it into Isilon, into a file system, the Media Asset Manager picks it up, and then puts it into Glacier, and it's just this continuous process. And then you can also use that to basically HSM existing assets on Isilon as well. So that's a pretty cool story. Uh, there is a three to five hour wait time, so beware of that. So if you are integrating your application, your application needs to be able to understand that wait time. We also have outbound notifications, a product called SNS, or Simple Notification Service, that integrates with Glacier to tell your app when it's queued up and staged and ready to go. But I would you know, ask you to compare to three to five hour, to five hour wait time versus you know, perhaps days to get tapes back from a vault. Right? So it's still a fantastic uh, value. Okay. There's a third piece I really view as a separate product. There's an object lifecycle manager that we recently released that enables you to automatically drop objects from S3 down into Glacier in an automated fashion based on object prefix and time. So maybe after 60 days or a year or whatever it is, you want to start cleaning up certain S3 buckets in an automated fashion. No problem, we can do that. Um, I have a... uh, uh, a, a, a very large American Spanish language broadcaster, it's a mouthful, uh, that has 170 terabytes uh, on S3. And uh, what we're doing with them is integrating to Glacier to, to basically drop those objects down to lower their cost. Uh, so they've had their syndication system connected into us for a while, uh, but now we need to go a little bit deeper uh, and provide that Glacier integration. And so you know, they'd like to be able to, within that syndication system, pull things out of Glacier. Well, that's when you really need to understand those requests and how to do that full integration. So we, we have resources to help you guys do that if you ever go down that route. <clears throat> okay, partner products. So... Uh, we've got three ingest solutions. Aspera, which I'm assuming most of you are familiar with. Fast file transfer. Thank you. They're a sponsor today. Attunity Cloud Beam, another uh, replication technology I'd like to talk about, as well as one that you may not be aware of called uh, Cycle Computing's Data Manager, which is a, a data mover uh, and a data orchestrator as well. Um, I did not include pricing on these products. Uh, we'll have to um, uh, plug you into those particular vendors to have that discussion. Okay, so... They just won an Emmy, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, on their fast protocol, Aspera. So congratulations to them. Um, uh, you know, very fast speed, uh, you know, up to a gigabit per AWS instance, engineered to run on EC2, has S3 integration, so you light up an Aspera instance on EC2, it does that parallelization between the EC2 instance and S3, you implement a client of d- all different sorts on your side, and it does a rapid acceleration in. Um, it's available as a bring-your-own license scenario where you can light up the, uh, the AMI and then plug in your, your, your license, or it's also available in Marketplace. Um, we have uh, not only not only they've done a good job integrating into AWS, but they've also integrated into ZenCoder and Encoding.com. So it's kind of cool to see how the industry is uh, maturing as it you know uh, certain companies not only integrate into our systems, but then into the companies that are actually running on us. It's just I find that interesting. Um, Netflix is a major a user of Aspera for ingest into AWS. Uh, some major Netflix competitors I can't mention also are major users of Aspera, and that same. American Spanish language broadcaster also uses Aspera to get data into the cloud. Uh, then a workflow kicks off to pick the asset up off of S3. They run it through a transcoder and stage it for content delivery to a CDN. Attunity also gets really fantastic speed. Um, they have a particular media and entertainment customer that has a gaming division that's uploading uh, one three terabytes a day. They're actually able to move a terabyte an hour, uh, so that, that's pretty good. Uh, I'm sorry, terabyte over every two hours and ingest into S3. Uh, But they do a lot more than just fast file movement. So they can pluck data from heterogeneous file systems, move it into S3. They can move data across S3 regions. We don't do that, but they can. So you can do S3 replication with these guys as a service, by the way. Um, But they also enable the ability to replicate heterogeneous databases to one another. And so I call it a, uh, a mapper, a mover, and a loader. So it'll actually map SQL assets to Oracle or MySQL to SQL. All right, so they'll actually do the replication, the movement, but it's not just those databases. It also plugs into Amazon Redshift. It plugs into EMR. So you could create a pretty interesting workflow here that integrates with on-prem file systems, S3 for staging, EMR for analytics, that's Elastic Map Reduce, that's our in-cloud Hadoop, Redshift for data warehousing. There's a lot of really cool things that these guys enable. So check out Attunity. Uh, and then Cycle Computing is their background is primarily uh, high performance computing orchestration on AWS. Really big in life sciences and the financial space. They do have some visual effects customers that are using their technology. And Data Manager is a component, it's a module of Cycle Server. 
Uh, so, so data mover, is, I'm sorry, data manager uh, will move the data and it will also orchestrate the data. So it's common to see visual effects shops move data in and then the rest of their portfolio can actually orchestrate massive render farms and transcode farms and actually own the whole thing in an automated fashion. So this particular product data manager it's automated, it moves, it creates audit and compliance trails, it encrypts, it reports on bandwidth usage, and you can put it in front of any file system. That's kind of a, a unique thing because a lot of these technologies need a specific API to plug into on a NAS, or if it just mounts a file share, most technologies don't have both Glacier and S3 integration. This one can sit in front of any single file system, move the data to either S3 or Glacier, and then you can also clean up the local disk and has the whole process to retrieve it as well. So this is a pretty cool technology. Okay, we're going to pivot into uh, storage solutions. How are we doing on time here? Okay, perfect. So three companies I'd like to highlight, and um, all of them are startups, right? So and when, I, when, I, when we I'd like to give a little disclaimer that we, we don't have testing facilities at this point at Amazon, okay? We publish the APIs and then people write to those APIs and then we learn whether or not these technologies ultimately work, right? So I wanna just throw that out there is that there's, there's, there's a lot of startups out there that plug into us that we can't control. We're talking tens of thousands of companies doing this, right? There's no way for us to inventory all this. That being said, we do, we do you know, uh, deal with a lot of these companies very often. And here's three very promising technologies I want to bring to the table, Avira, Imaginatics, uh, and Panzera. So I want to start with uh, the concept of what a cloud storage gateway is first before I go into it. So if you have a traditional, let's just talk NAS for a second. If, if you have a traditional NAS implementation, you have clustered filer heads, you'll have lots of racks of disk, and you're consuming lots of power and cooling in space, and you're backing it up and snapping, and then you're replicating to a secondary location. It's complex, it's expensive, and it's very common. Uh, if you leverage a cloud storage gateway, <laughs> Uh, this dramatically changes things because what you have is a local caching device where the end user essentially gets a, uh, uh, you know, a, a land speed, disk speed experience because of the local caching. Uh, uh, it'll, they'll, they'll present you know, POSIX compliant NFS and, and SMB. Uh, so many of them will do actually global, uh, global namespace across geographies and within data centers with some do global dedupe and global locking, which is pretty wild. The data will hit that device It'll do variable block length deduplication. I know not, not quite so relevant for media. Compression, encryption on that device. This is in your data center. Encryption on this device. Key generation, key management in that device as well. And then uh, tiering mechanisms where it'll cache the data locally for a period of time, but all data is always replicated into S3. And then it'll evict blocks or files that are cold and then put a pointer there to point to the actual asset again sitting in S3, which is how our gateway works that I mentioned earlier. That connection between that device and S3 is also WAN accelerated. And so what you can have, for example, is a 4U device with maybe 20 terabytes of SSD and 10 gig NICs, that's high performance localized access, and then 500 terabytes in S3, and your actual application or end user sees that 500 terabytes as if it's all local. And you're talking hopefully over direct connect, maybe over WAN accelerated connections, even in block volume scenarios, a single block volume for some, like our SAN, you could have 40% in the cache and 60% in the cloud. The application doesn't time out, it works. So in the file space, this works as well. So this is a really compelling technology. Embedded snapshots enables you to get rid of backup software, backup hardware, tape, tape machines, offsite tape. The tiering mechanisms, this eviction I keep talking about, cleaning up that local cache, is basically HSM. So now you don't need, you don't need archive software, you don't need archive hardware. <clears throat> You have a full copy of all your data that's geographically distributed. So in many cases, you actually don't need disaster recovery data centers for those data sets. And lots of these gateways actually run virtually in the cloud, which means I can pull it right back out on EC2 and have a point of egress to my render farms, transcode farms, whatever it might be, which is pretty cool. So here is the first example, actually, I knew I was gonna forget this slide. Many of them, thank you, offer a global namespace as well. So you could have a, a variety of people working in different locations around the, the sun. You know, follow the sun development's a big one in the legal space. Uh, we see uh, follow the sun case management, for example, um, uh, where you'll see the same data sets, same directory structures, and it'll actually do locking as well. 
uh, that you typically only experience with the, in a building, with a NAS on a LAN, you can now actually achieve this uh, across a, a WAN for a company, including a global deduplication, which is a centralized dedupe tables, as well as global lock management. So, so pretty advanced stuff. So um, an example I want to talk about, first one is Avir. Now, Avir has been in the market for about, I think, four or five years at this point. Uh, excellent management team, a really smart group of people. Um, they, uh, what they have right now is a caching device that sits in front of existing NAS boxes. So perhaps you're running you know, Isilon or NetApp or you have an older BlueArc device or whatever sort of, of storage system that you have. You can put as small as a two-node of your cluster, which will run you about 50K, and you can continue to scale to, I think, 50 nodes. And what it does is it then completely reorganizes where the data lives and pulls data into that cache so you have much faster reads, as also much faster writes. And in a rack and a half, these guys uh, beat the world record for a single scale out file system. I'm, I'm not talking about refrigerators with multiple parallel file systems. I'm talking about one file system that spans a bunch of nodes that you keep adding like bricks and bricks. In a rack and a half, they beat uh, one leading scale out vendor in all SSDs in a seven rack cluster and another leading vendor who just released about a year ago their scale-out technology, uh, then a 12-rat cluster, these guys beat in a rat, rack and a half. So this, is, this was measured in NFS ops per second. For those of you familiar with spec, sfs.org, that's sort of the enterprise. Uh, you know, you, if you're on that list, you're, you're one of the real players, and these guys hold the world record. Why I'm so excited about this is they are going to announce their integration with us at reInvent in November, um, and they're going to be a gateway to both S3 and Glacier. So you'll have a directory structure. You can label some uh, folders as Glacier folders, others as S3 folders. You can drag and drop between them. Uh, they've taken care of all you know, this parallelization and multi-threading that we talked about. And where it gets really cool is you can implement this technology in front of an existing NAS. Uh, you can turn on a piece of software they have called FlashMove, which enables you to non-disruptively copy all that data out of that NAS through that front end into S3 or Glacier. And this is all done non-disruptively. All the namespace is maintained. Nothing changes. Obviously, when you implement those nodes, there's like a three-second quick namespace cutover. Do that during off hours. But for the most part, nothing changes from an end user perspective. You're not remapping applications or users. The, let's, say the, let's say the migration takes a month or two months, however long it is because you have a lot of data. Once that migration or copying is done, you can then switch the mode in their cluster, turn their file system on, which is the fastest file system in the world, uh, and you can non-disruptively retire and decommission the back-end NAS, and what you're left with is a two-node or a four-node device that can scale up to a 50-node cluster, which is now a gateway to an 11.9 geographically distributed active object store, which is S3 and Glacier. So this, is a, this one's going to be a blockbuster. I think it's going to be a bloodbath in the industry with this one, so I'm very excited about this. Um, Maginatics is another really cool forward-thinking file system. Very excited about this one. There's no concept of a filer with this file system. Uh, you put clients on endpoints such as iOS and Android, laptops, workstations, desktops, servers, Linux, Windows, OSX are the supported platforms, if I'm remembering correctly. And the endpoint becomes the filer. That client actually presents SIFs and NFS on that endpoint. That client does variable block length, deduplication, compression, encryption, chunks each individual file into individual chunks. Each individual chunk is encrypted, and all the keys for each chunk are managed in the, in the MAGFS, if you can see, you know, in this metadata cluster here, which will be behind your firewall, either in a VPC on us or in your data center. Um, it has Active Directory integration, and then those clients read and write directly to S3, which is an architecture I think you're going to start seeing more and more as time goes on. Um, these guys do a global namespace. They do global deduplication. They do global locking. They also have an awesome management team, uh, very deep uh, from you know, Andrew file system lineage, if you will. Uh, and so for distributed users, for distributed data access, uh, a really good use case. Um, for streaming sequential read workloads, excellence. An example is that same customer that was that aggregator, that media aggregator in New York City. We put a fresh client install on his Windows machine. We gave him the credentials. Um, the directory listing popped up in, you know, in seconds. We had the metadata components of this file system in, uh, running on EC2 in US East in Northern Virginia. We had six movies stored in S3 in Oregon, so US West region. 
Uh, clean install on this guy's computer, so no caching whatsoever. Uh, entered the creds, directory listing pops up. We double click a Bug's Life, which was the first one, uh, first movie in the list. And media player pops open in about three to four seconds. The movie starts playing perfectly in 1080p. Um, this is over public internet, no CDN, no web server, an office Wi-Fi, on a fresh new install, and you could take the scroll bar and drag and drop it anywhere in the movie, and it would immediately react almost as if it was on disk. So uh, the use cases for this one are almost endless from a certain perspective. I think this is going to be really interesting for, for OEM, but a very new technology. But if you guys are curious about this, I, I, I recommend you check it out, because this one looks pretty promising as well. And then the last one I'll talk about is Panzura. That would be my timer done. Sorry about that. Um, uh, the last one is Panzer. So very similar from the context of global namespace, global lock management, global deduplication. Um, but they actually are, are more filer based. So they actually have a, a heavy duty cache that, you know, a server that you'll implement into data centers. I believe they can scale, if I'm not mistaken, up to 350 terabytes for a cache. Uh, they do get some pretty phenomenal throughput capability. Um, so great for massive ingest. Current S3 integration, uh, Glacier integration, uh, great partner, also a sponsor as well. So thank you to these guys. Move on from here. This is a quick blurb on TCO. Um, TCO on-prem to cloud for storage is not simple. Uh, and uh, the point of this slide is to show a lot of the considerations that you must take into place, uh, take into play if you're looking at the cost of on-prem storage versus cloud-based. Um, we have people that we've hired out of top consulting firms to help us with this. We've got tools. Uh, please work with us if you're trying to put together an ROI and a TCO. Um, if you're interested in leveraging us for you know, long-term archive for your assets, if you're interested uh, in, in maybe one of these gateways, right? W work with us. We'll help you. I, I, I highly recommend it. Most of the time, by the way, when customers attempt it on their own, it's, they're almost always wrong. And maybe there's not one right perfect answer, but you know, meeting of the minds makes it uh, more uh, as close as we can get. So here's my last slide. So um, we are offering $1,000 of promotional credits for up to 20 customers uh, that qualify to test one of these listed eight solutions. I did pull Direct Connect out of this because it just takes too long to provision telco links sometimes, so that's a little muddy. Uh, but everything else here it can, it can happen quickly. All the partners that are listed are willing to provide uh, their technology for a free POC, and we will offer up to $1,000 for either EBS, S3 Glacier, uh, S3 Glacier, Import Export, uh, and our gateway as well. Um, so if you're interested at all in this, um, please email me here. Uh, Jay Downey at Amazon.com, uh, and uh, you know if I don't get back to you quickly, just please keep emailing me because there could be a lot of incoming emails with this one. Uh, but we'll certainly follow up with you. So thank you all very much for your time, and uh, I guess you're up here, Bob. Right? Thanks. Thank you.